On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we talk about using force plates to better program our athletes in the gym. The Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Round Show. I'm here with the crew, some PTs and strength coaches from Champion PT and Performance answering your questions. Anything you want to talk about, PT, sports performance, career advice, head to MikeReynolds.com, click on that podcast link and ask away. Let's see. We have Dan Pope, Dwesh Podell, Lenny McCrina, Mike Scaduto, Jonah Monlock, Lisa Lowe, and Dave Tilly today. Len, who do we have for students? We have some amazing students that have been here for weeks now, and we just love nurturing them and helping them develop as amazing clinicians. <clears throat> we have Courtney Camborellis from Dewville in, um, in in Buffalo. I, um, I, I'm curious to know the origin of the name Dewville because I feel like it's something very interesting, and I'm gonna I'm gonna find out. And we also have Nancy Kuhn, Nancy Kuhn from Mary Baldwin University. Fun fact about Nancy Kuhn, her middle school teacher is Lisa's mom. Pretty crazy. What? Crazy. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> right. Crazy. And and I witnessed this the the discovery of this yesterday <laughs> too. And it was like you could tell that Nancy's eyes were like, oh my God, I hated that. That was like my least favorite teacher. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know if Lisa's mom listens to the podcast at all. Uh, but <laughs> I, like, she she says, no. I mean, Katie's mom still does, I think. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's up, Mary? Shout out to Mary. <laughs> anyway, what did, Courtney, what, what do we have for a question today, Courtney? Shout out to Feeney. All right. So Stephanie from California, I want to purchase force plates to help me build better training programs for my athletes. There seems like there are a ton of things to look at. Where would you recommend I get started with something simple? I love it. And you know what? I think Stephanie, you've already made the first step in this force plate journey where you've identified that um, there's a lot of complexity here and you wanna start simple, right? I like that. So I think that's a good way to start this. Um, I wasn't sure by this question, Stephanie, if this, it, it, it seems to me like this is kind of more from a strength and conditioning perspective and a performance perspective than than the rehab. So let's, we'll keep the discussion on that today, but maybe we'll do another episode with uh, force plates for, for the rehab setting uh, in the future. I like that, but um, let, I don't, let's start off Jonah, you know, obviously Jonah coordinates our sports science here at champion. We, we've been doing a lot of force plates for um, you know, a, a bit of time here at champion. Um, I know this is a question that we dealt with ourselves, but I know it's something that you, you know, we're evolving over time. What would you say to somebody that wants to get started with force plates? There's so much to look at. Where do you get started? What's the biggest bang for your buck to get started using force plates um, for programming? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you first off on admitting that it is overwhelming as a really good starting point. <laughs> right. And when you open up your like list of metrics you can look at and there's a hundred things to choose from, it's, it is quite overwhelming. Um, so I think in terms of, you need your test selection and then you need your metric selection. Um, so one is just asking kind of what your population is that you work with. If you tend to work with a lot of younger athletes, you probably don't need as big of a variety of tests. Um, with those tr lower training ages, there's not as much individualization they need. They probably can all benefit from getting stronger. Um, so if that's the type of population you're working with, Honestly, just a counter movement jump would be a really, really good starting place. It's something that everybody is going to be fairly familiar with um, and you get a ton of good information from it as long as you're executing it pretty well. Um, so if you know that like a counter movement jump is going to be your go to test, then the next question would be what metrics you want to look at. Um, so in terms of some ideas from that, I think RSI modified, um, which is looking at how high you're jumping compared to how long it takes you to jump is one of our kind of go-to measures. It 
touches on a whole lot of different aspects. You're not going to get a really, really good like score on that if you don't jump high and if you can't move quick. Once you're looking at your RSI modified, um, you want to know why they do or don't score well on that. So from there, looking at your jump height and then your like contraction time or time to take off is the next really good step. Because that starts to give you a little bit of insight into why somebody does well. Maybe they move extremely quickly, but they don't get all that high, um, in which case probably the force production end is what you need to keep continue to focus on with your athlete. Whereas say they jump relatively quickly, but it takes them a long time to get there. Then more of that rate of force development stuff is what you want to look at. And if you're curious about that, there's a former episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds show you can go to. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think starting really simple counter movement jump is probably going to be your go-to test. And honestly, starting with like just those three measures there, any other measures you can start to look at kind of what, what matters in your specific sport. So if you have, like we do, we've got athletes from all different sports. So it helps to stay a little more generic, but then we will get a little bit more specific with our baseball players or our golfers. Uh, if you're working with a lot of linemen in football, the measures they are going to care about is going to be a whole lot different than what Dave's gymnasts are going to care about. Um, so you can definitely start to get specific, but by starting with those kind of three pretty basic measures of the easiest test to execute, I think that's going to let you just get comfortable using force plates and you can build from there. I love it. Jonah, when does this start to become important in the development of an athlete? Like, is this, is this really important information for a 10 year old versus an 18 year old versus a professional athlete? Like when do you start using this data even more? Yeah. So I, I think it's important to track from day one because kids love knowing if they're jumping higher than they were before helps them gain confidence, helps them just enjoy the training process from a, actual programming perspective i would say at least you're going to be like a year into the training process before you're going to change even like one exercise probably based on any of these numbers so there is definitely right. a time period there as we get older so like with some of the professional baseball players we're working with we're testing isometric mid thigh pulls counter movement jump squat jump pop test we're doing some med ball testing and a lot of their program is being dictated by the various numbers we see and it kind of just scales from your beginner new athletes where we're testing just to see progress but we're not changing anything all the way up to those highest level athletes where a lot of their program is changing i, li I like that because i i get nervous like when I, I read that question from stephanie i get nervous that somebody's going to start like like overemphasizing this with the 12 year old that just got to the gym for the first time so I like that. Um, I, I like how you said to like start with the counter movement jump. I mean, there's just so much information you can get from that. Um, I, I'll share from my experience that um, I was nervous a little bit about just looking at vertical and just looking at counter movement jumps. Um, but I dug into this a little bit. I talked to a bunch of people, I talked to some of the biomechanists that, that I'm friends with. Um, and there really is just a ton of carryover with that, right? And even some of the things we started looking at, the biomechanics of pitching, like in our lab with the White Sox, some of the things we started looking at um, is even some of our like lateral horizontal type movements that we do in our athletes is vertical just with their shin angled, right? So instead of the shin being completely upright, your shin's just at a 45 degrees angle and then you jump vertically from 45 degrees. So um, I just share that with the, the person that's like, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not just working with basketball athletes, right? It's very obvious like in, in something like that. Um, I, 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 I think there's benefit for looking at this for a lot of different force productions and the lower half really, really does that. So um, Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I just oh, sorry, to... Jonah. Sorry, oh, Jonah. I, I, I don't want to cut Jonah off. Sorry. I was just going to follow up on that by saying you can start to do kind of some of those little investigations on your own. Um, so like for one of my projects from a master's, I looked at what measures from a counter movement jump relate to exit velocity among hitters. Um, so that helps us know now when we are working with high school hitters, especially because that was the age I worked with, um, what measures are going to mean the most to them when it comes to trying to hit the ball harder. So if you work right. with a lot of football players and they're getting ready for combines and pro agility is a big test you're trying to improve them on, take a look at what measures relate back to um, your pro agility scores. And that might give you an idea of 
what things matter for you. Um, Cause there's so many measures out there that there's probably something that does relate quite highly <laughs> to the thing you care right. about. Nice. Yeah. Good point. Uh, Dave. Yeah. I just want to say that I consider myself the polar like end of Jonah, which is Jonah super well knowledgeable. And I'm like literally just dipping my toes into the the research. And he sent me articles because I'm starting to do this with more like uh, athletic performance for gymnastics. And I think the best thing you can do when you first get it is talk to someone who really knows the system. Well, like Jonah, be like, okay, like what should I measure and what should I look at? And then just get reps under your belt of just like testing people. So I have some people who are like post-op ACL and we have some other people that are just trying to do every two weeks, just trying to do a counter movement, a squat jump and a, and a, a hop test. And then I literally take the data and think about what it might mean. And I walk over to Jonah or Duesh and I like, okay, am, am I just like thinking through this correctly of like this and this, and they'll say, you're right here. You're not here. Or here. And I'll be like, okay, well, programming wise, what does that mean? So like, I think that fluid conversation of like small five minute chunks and just getting into a habit of testing people. Cause I'm probably terrible, right? I probably still do a bunch of stuff. Not great, but I'm still just like getting reps in. And I think that's better than just staring at vault data and being like, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we've all felt that, right? We all look at that and the potential and you get really excited about it. And then you realize like, let's just get good at a few things before we start getting super fancy. Right. But um, Dwesh, from your perspective, how has your programming changed with force plates? Like what do you do different based on this information that, that Jonah was talking about? Yeah, I think it, it simply just provides us another level of customization, right? I think we've always been for a long time, been good at looking at uh, movement competencies, movement quality, um, you know, doing all of our table assessments or CPS assessments, knowing how someone moves and then talking to them about their goals and relate all of that together. Well, now we have a layer of how they move, their goals, their sport requirement, but also their current physical outputs. Um, and we get to really enhance some of that stuff. Now, going back to what Jonah said, it does take a long time for us to accumulate data that's going to be consistent enough for us to say, you know what, I think I have enough data points where now I think I understand the athlete. And then I think on another level, even if we go back to what Dave was saying about just getting enough practice reps in, if you're not administering the test pretty consistently, a counter movement jump can show you completely different metrics if you go slow on your eccentric versus if you go fast on your eccentric, right? Those are completely two different data points that's not even speaking the same language. You're not comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges. So I think being really consistent in how you input the data or how you intake the data is going to be important. And then once you have a good few data points, then you can really start to see trends and say, all right, this person's like Jonah was giving the example of the RSI mod, right? That's a really good one. This person's RSI mod is actually really low. Well, is it because they're not moving fast or is it because they're not forceful enough to project themselves off the ground? And we know that RSI mod is a pretty good indicator of just how quickly you can, you know, make that contraction happen while having a good effective output. So I think it's it's stuff like that. So to to go back to your question, I think it simply helps us be a little bit more pinpoint in our programming. Um, and really make specific moves within the program that affect that one piece of the, the outcome measure. Awesome. Yeah. And, and hopefully help take that athlete to the next level, right? Because yeah. um, sometimes they're training, not necessarily the wrong thing, but they train the same thing over and over again. Maybe there's a potential to increase, increase capacity in some way that, you know, we didn't realize before we started digging deep into these, these differences. So, yeah, um, I so, think, I think our industry is definitely very guilty of, we, we pride ourselves in being strength coaches. And I think we've even like shortened up our, our title from strength and conditioning coaches to just strength coaches, where we were so obsessed with just getting stronger and stronger and stronger, where we just thought that if we just add 10 pounds to someone's deadlift every off season, that they're going to get better at their sport. Whereas I think this force play technology has really made us rethink that and, and say, you know, is, is strength really the only thing that we're chasing, right? What are some other, you know, pinpoint data points that we can find and improve athleticism that way or improve performance within that sport that way, instead of just saying squat heavier, deadlift heavier, bench heavier, right? We know that getting strong is important, but it's not the only thing that's important for sports performance. So I think that's really opened up our eyes at least. And, you know, hopefully the, the rest of the community starts really finding some passion and using this technology to help grow the profession in general. Awesome. I don't think I could think of a better way of uh, finishing the episode with that. So thank you. That was perfect. Uh, Stephanie, hopefully that helps. Um, get started, start simple. And as your uh, experience with the force plates grow, um, I look forward to you sharing that with all of us with what you're learning, because um, I'd be, it'd be great for us to all share and hear how we're applying it uh, to our different athletes. So 
Thanks so much. Uh, if you have a question like that, head to MikeReynolds.com, click on the podcast link, and you can fill out the form to ask us a question. And be sure to go to Apple Podcasts and Spotify to subscribe and give us a nice review so we can we can always make this podcast better. Thanks so much. See you on the next episode.